Good morning. I'm Judy Persichilli, New Jersey's Health Commissioner, and it's my pleasure to be here today hosting Deborah Heart and Lung Center's virtual health forum, Women to Women Talk Heart to Heart. As many of you know, in addition to my role with the state, I'm, I'm also a registered nurse. I started my career as a registered nurse. So I'm doubly pleased to welcome you here today. Public health is my passion, and that passion has been supremely challenged during the past year with the COVID-19 pandemic. As we continue to make progress against the virus, I am reminded about all the other health sacrifices people have made along the way. Skipping routine doctor appointments, ignoring symptoms out of fear of visiting a healthcare facility, and sometimes even ignoring health emergencies. An event like today offers an opportunity for all of us to recalibrate and refocus our health and to build back on our baseline of primary care to strengthen our overall well being and to resume those vitally important specialist appointments for comprehensive management of chronic conditions. Nowhere is this more powerfully important than for women. Even prior to the pandemic, as many of you know, women typically deferred their health care needs to the needs of others. So many women spend time making sure that everyone else is taken care of. Their routine appointments are made, that their follow-up is given, nutritious meals are served and prepared, and schedules are coordinated. Sometimes women forget to take care of themselves because they're championing on like invincible heroes, making sure that everyone is okay. The, this pandemic made this even worse because now many women have had to add responsibilities of juggling work and family, homeschooling, elder care. Working at home became a, a new norm for many women. And for others, working in essential jobs and juggling all those other responsibilities became a pressing daily struggle simply to survive during these trying times. I'm happy to see hospitals like Deborah Heart and Lung Center step up to the plate to shine a spotlight back on women and their health needs. We have long known that heart disease is still the number one killer among women and that women still don't recognize the signs and symptoms of a heart attack, which often present very differently than men. Women also think that heart disease is sort of a man's disease. And as sometimes that doesn't affect young and middle-aged women. All of these perceptions are wrong. And with many women pushing their care back to the back burner, it's time to bring that back to the forefront. These additional risk factors for women are especially pronounced during COVID-19. We know that those that are healthier and stronger are more able to fight this virus. Now more than ever, women have to take their medical care seriously. We hope that today's event will rejuvenate you and refocus your thoughts on your own personal health and wellness journey. First up today, is cardiologist Dr. Renee Bullock Palmer, who is going to speak to you about taking care of your heart in the COVID-19 era. Dr. Bullock Palmer, in addition to serving as Deborah's director of the Women's Heart Center, is also the hospital's director of non-invasive cardiac imaging. She holds multi-board certifications and is a fellow of numerous professional medical societies. In addition to publishing widely, she is a much sought after speaker, sharing her extensive knowledge, not only on women in heart disease, but also of the extended risk factors that affect the health and well being of vulnerable populations, particularly African Americans, a group that COVID has been particularly hard on. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bullock Palmer. Hello, everyone. Welcome and thanks for attending our virtual Women's Heart event today. I'm Dr. Renee Bullock Palmer, an attending cardiologist and director of the Women's Heart Center and Non-Invasive Cardiac Imaging. Today, I will be speaking on living your heart healthiest life in the COVID-19 era. 
So heart disease is still the number one killer of women in the United States. As you can see in this bar graph, although the death rate has been declining, unfortunately, over the most recent years, cardiovascular disease mortality, that's the death rate, is currently increasing. Additionally, in the younger age group of patients, for patients aged less than 35 years, cardiovascular death rates is greater in women compared to men. Now, the reasons for this include the fact that there's increased cardiovascular disease risk burden among young, wo young women. And these risks include high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, tobacco smoking, sedentary living, as well as obesity. Now, there are several risk factors for heart disease. On the left, there's a modifiable risk factors, those are risk factors that you can change. And on the right, there's a non-modifiable risk factors, those are risk factors that you cannot change. The modifiable risk factors include diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, smoking, and physical inactivity. The non-modifiable risk factors include a family history of premature heart disease, increasing age, and gender. Now, the American Heart Association has outlined Life Simple 7 plan to maintain a heart-healthy lifestyle of being active, maintaining a healthy weight, avoiding tobacco smoking, maintaining low cholesterol levels, maintaining well-controlled blood pressure readings, and eating a heart-healthy diet, and of course, maintaining a healthy blood glucose level. The prevalence of, heart, of high blood pressure is highest, unfortunately, in the African-American population, as well as the increased prevalence of obesity, both in Hispanics and African-Americans. Additionally, with regards to diabetes, the, um, the prevalence is highest in um, Hispanics and African-Americans, as well as hyperlipidemia having an equal prevalence among various ethnicities. It's very important, therefore, to know and understand your own risk factors with regards to heart disease. Therefore, you should know your numbers in, in, with regards to your blood pressure, your weight, your glucose levels, your cholesterol levels. If you do smoke, consider tobacco smoking cessation and also managing your numbers and therefore knowing your own individual risk. So what can you do to decrease your risk of heart disease and complications both in and beyond pregnancy for women and also throughout your life. Most important thing is knowing your family history. Therefore, if you've had a family history being, being a first degree family member, that's your parent, that's mother or father or sibling who has had heart disease with a blockage in their vessels, either with a heart attack or was found out through a stress test leading to uh, stenting or bypass surgery, particularly if they're males less than 55, year, 55 years of age, and if they're females less than 65 years of age. So if you've had a parent or a sibling with this history, then you do definitely have a family history of premature heart disease, and you yourself are at risk of having heart disease. So knowing your family history is one thing, adopting heart-healthy habits such as, as to, uh, tobacco smoking cessation, minimizing your alcohol use, maintaining a healthy weight, and getting enough sleep, and of course, managing your stress. Now, if you're pregnant or, or thinking of pregnancy, it is very important to know your heart-related risk. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, pregnancy-related death rates is highest in our country relative to other developed countries, and is also highest in minorities such as African Americans. So therefore, it's very important to know your risk, even if you're considering pregnancy. Therefore, getting your blood pressure checked, your cholesterol levels checked, your diabetes, glucose levels checked, even before considering pregnancy is important. If you do have a history of birth defects like congenital heart disease, it is very important for you to see your cardiologist before considering pregnancy because there are some uh, congenital heart disease defects that may make pregnancy very dangerous or may have to have some treatments before considering pregnancy. Now, if you do have heart disease or heart-related disease risk factors such as diabetes or high blood pressure or high cholesterol, it is very important to take your medications. Also, even in your pregnancy state, if you do have a um, history of um, considering pregnancy, there are certain medications that have to be avoided in pregnancy. But beyond the pregnancy years, just simply making sure that you take your medications that are prescribed for you.
Now, if you do have an issue with any of your medications, it's very important to let your cardiologist or let your primary care physician know, know of this before stopping these medications. Many times there are alternative medications that could be considered or also the dose might have to be adjusted to minimize these adverse reactions. Now, regular visits to your doctor is very important. So if you do have heart disease or heart disease risk factors, seeing your cardiologist on a regular basis is important. There's something called the Well Woman's Heart uh, Visit that I am completely endorsed. So I do believe that anyone above the age of 40, particularly females, even if you do not have an established history of heart disease, even checking with a cardiologist once um, every one or two years, checking your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your glucose levels is very important. Many times your physician can work with you to coordinate care for detected cardiovascular disease and also risk factors as well. Diet is important, so making sure that you're watching what you're eating and eating very healthily. So trying to avoid any fast foods, trying to avoid any foods with very high uh, cholesterol levels in there or trans fats. Um, also minimizing your sugar intake is very important and planning your meals. And it's very important in the, um, very difficult in this era of COVID-19. Uh, many times there's food insecurity, but making sure that whatever um, food items that you do have in your pantry or in your kitchen is as healthy as possible. Now, maintaining a healthy weight comes in part with eating a heart-healthy diet. So, therefore, you have to think of not only what you're taking in in terms of eating, but also your energy expenditure. So, trying to do some form of exercise to maintain a healthy weight. Um, studies have shown that the um, more weight that is lost, the less risk, um, the less um, chance that you have for developing diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and ultimately heart disease. So setting goals for exercise. Um, so the American Heart Association recommends at least 150 minutes of exercise per week of moderate um, aerobic activity. This can be broken down in multiple um, spurts throughout the day or throughout the week. So simply things such as you know walking for half an hour five days a week or if you can do seven days a week would be ideal. Um, staying motivated, so therefore if you have a partner or child or a spouse that can help you and in also being your exercise partner in, in terms of achieving these physical activity uh, milestones. And also pedometer tracking your steps is also very important. The American Heart Association recommends 10,000 steps a day. So if you can try to get to that goal would be ideal. So what are the benefits of physical activity? So not only is it beneficial in controlling and maintaining your weight, as I had mentioned before, it reduces your risk of heart disease, also reduces your risk for certain cancers, breast cancer, uterine cancer, um, improves your overall mental health and mood, um, it strengthens your bones and muscles, so um, decreases your risk of developing a weak bone or osteoporosis. And overall, it increases your chances of living longer. It promotes a better sleeping habit and strengthens your lungs and heart. There are various ways to make this fun, um, choosing activities that can involve your family, friends, choosing a variety of activities so you do not, you do not get bored doing one activity every day, um, using, um, engaging friends and family, as I had mentioned, and also joining a community group um, such as a, um, an exercise group club or organize special events around that. Now, weight loss is very important. So the American Society um, College of Sports Medicine have recommended certain guidelines to maintain a, a healthy weight. They recommend 150 to 250 minutes of moderate physical activity per week of exercise. If your goal is to lose weight, then they recommend more than 250 minutes as more than four hours per week. And also if you're preventing um, regaining any of the weight that you have lost, maintaining more than four hours a week of exercise is important. So stress management. So of course, I do not have to tell everyone that the last year and a half has been very stressful for everyone um, to varying degrees. And, um, you know, it's very difficult. It's, it's basically impossible to, to avoid stress. But what you can control is how you react to stress. Um, so trying to set priorities, um, talk to someone if you need to have a counselor, um, trying to reach out to get help um, with regards to stress management. Do not be shy to ask for help if you need, especially for working mothers, struggling, balancing, you know, professional life and children. Also, you know, having the fact that children are having to be at, at school, at home, being um, with at home schooling can be very challenging. So getting help or asking for help is very important in terms of managing your stress.
you know, five ways to keep yourself safe with regards to heart disease, especially as we enter the summer months and into the fall, staying active, um, also managing your stress, taking your medications, getting your flu shot during the flu season, and also getting your COVID-19 vaccine, wearing a mask, um, especially very important that if you have not been vaccinated or if you have young children who have not been vaccinated, they are still at risk of getting this disease, very important to wear your mask. Um, if you do have symptoms of heart attack or stroke, chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, um, change in uh, twisting of the face or loss of speech uh, or change in speech pattern, these are some of the signs that you might be having a stroke or a heart attack, very important to call 911. If there have been any procedures or appointments that have been postponed or delayed, um, trying to re-engage um, with your physician, your um, healthcare facility, um, so just lastly, just a bit on COVID-19 vaccines. Um, you know, we have had the um, benefit of having three uh, vaccines available to us in the United States. And it's very important that, um, you know, to know that these vaccines are safe. And I highly endorse everyone to consider getting themselves vaccinated, um, you know, if they're eligible with regards to age. So these vaccines work by tra um, training the body to make antibodies to fight the infection should you be exposed to the infection. So it builds your immunity. This takes a few weeks for the body to produce these memory cells to make these antibodies. And there's some more information and resources, American Heart Association, ACC, and the CDC. And again, I thank you for attending our virtual event, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bullock Palmer, for sharing that valuable information. I'd now like to present endocrinologist, Dr. Navinder Jaisal, Director of Endocrinology and Diabetes Services at Deborah's Specialty Physicians. Dr. Jaisal has a wide range of medical interests. In addition to diabetes, she is focused on metabolic factors contributing to osteoporosis, obesity, and thyroid disease, as well as polycystic ovary syndrome. These areas often overlap specifically into women's health. And today she will share insights on diet and lifestyle and choices to prevent diabetes. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jaisal. Good morning, everyone. My name is Navinder Jassal, and I'm the Director of Endocrinology at Deborah Specialty Physicians at the Diabetes Center. Today, I'm going to be talking about the key to quarantine 19 weight loss and diabetes management. I have noticed that my patients with diabetes have really been struggling since COVID started. Since the pandemic, Gyms have been closed and we're stuck at home and a lot of us are baking more than normal and we've gained a couple pounds. So I'm gonna to talk to you about techniques and ways to reduce your weight. And this is geared towards diabetics, but honestly, anyone can take this advice and use it even if you're not diabetic. So let's get right into it. I like to bring up this slide because it gives us just a global perspective of how diabetes has an impact on probably everyone. I'm sure either you have diabetes or you know somebody that has diabetes. So we're all impacted. It's estimated in 2015 that 415 million people worldwide have diabetes. And it's expected by 2040 that that number will increase to two, uh, 642. So how do we manage diabetes? Well, it's a team approach. It's not just one person that will help you. So you wanna um, touch base with an educator that can teach you about the disease and tips and tricks. Having a nutritionist on hand is also key. Getting physical activity is part of your treatment plan. So whether that's going to a gym, exercising at home, or having a trainer help you out, uh, diabetes meds, that's where I help out in, as well as um, helping you with your regular checkups. And then having proper foot care with a podiatrist is important at least once a year. And same thing with your ophthalmologist or optometrist to have your eyes checked. Now, why do we care about losing weight? We care because 
it will improve your diabetes as well as other metabolic parameters, such as your blood pressure or your cholesterol. And it will also reduce your need for medications, which is great. Nobody wants to take medications unless they have to. It will improve your quality of life. I have patients that complain of joint pains, some acid reflux and sleep apnea, and some weight loss can help with those disease states as well. Um, losing about five to 10% of your weight will actually increase your life expectancy. That's if you're diabetic or not diabetic. So weight loss is not about a cosmetic issue, but it's about increasing your lifespan and will also decrease your risk of certain types of cancers. This slide is really important. Although different diet types did not yield significantly different weight loss, greater diet adherence was significantly associated with weight loss. What does that mean? Basically, it doesn't matter if you wanna do the keto diet, intermittent fasting, or whatever is on trend at the moment. Pick whatever diet composition that you like and stick with it. As long as you stick with it, you will lose weight. So it doesn't matter what type of diet, but find what you like and what you enjoy and what fits in your lifestyle. Carbs, so I talk a lot about carbs with my patients and um, I wanna reiterate that ca carbs are not bad. We need carbs to survive. So what do we wanna know about carbs when we decide what to eat? We wanna focus on the quality and the quantity of our carbs. When I talk about the quality of the carbs, I'm kind of focusing on the glycemic index. Maybe you've heard that term. Basically, it means when you eat a certain food, how high is it gonna raise my sugar and what's gonna to happen to my sugar after that? So your typical high glycemic foods like cakes, cookies, pastas, they will increase your sugar right away, but then it'll also kind of drop it, what you might have heard of as a sugar crash. The problem with those foods are when your sugar goes really high, your body may only be able to handle 50% of that and then the rest gets stored as fat. So that's the problem with these high glycemic foods. Also, they're not good for our sugars. So we like to focus on the quality of um, and having and eating lower glycemic foods. So foods with more protein like our lentils, beans, hummus, and nuts those will not raise your sugar so dramatically and they'll slowly be digested. So the next slide, I don't really like the term good and bad. I'd like to say better foods for you are obviously greens, fruits and vegetables and foods that maybe we should limit or have on occasion are your sodas, pastas, rice, etc. And we all know that, but it's good to get reminded. Now, when we talk about the quantity of carbs, we wanna count how many carbs we're eating. And often, nutritionists and dietitians will talk about carb exchanges. One carb exchange is 15 grams of carbs. Now, what does that really mean? We'll talk about that more in the next slides, but how many are we actually allowed? Men are allowed about 60 grams of carbs, and generally, for females, we say about 45 and that's per meal. So a meal is two to three times a day, and if you wanna have a snack, I say limit your carbs to about 15 to 20 grams of carbs, and that's one to two times a day. So here are some common fruits and their carb exchanges or their carb amounts. So a medium apple is one carb exchange or 15 grams of carbs. Um, a small banana is also the same. And what I often do is I'll Google avocado, how many grams of carbs. So luckily we can all do that with our um, fancy phones these days. And there are also a lot of apps that you can obtain online. Now a piece of toast is 15 grams of carbs. Half a cup of dried beans could be about 15 grams of carbs. And we know pasta, about half a cup is 20 grams of carbs. So with this information, how do we plan our meals? If I'm gonna go have lunch, I will think, okay, I'm gonna have two pieces of toast, that's 15 grams of carbs each, so that's about 30. If I add turkey or lettuce, that's pretty much zero grams of carbs, if anything, so, you know, that's zero. 
and then I may have a small apple. And total, that'll be about 45 grams of carbs. And that kind of gives you an estimate of where you want to stay. Now, in terms of what you want to drink, I would say stick to water. Let's avoid those concentrated sweets. So looking about, uh, thinking about what we talked about, you want to balance your meal. We talked about the carbs. And then the other thing is you want to make sure you have protein with each meal, some vegetables, and fruit is great, but it also has a lot of carbs. So you want to factor that into your meal planning. The order of what you eat does matter too. So I like to tell my patients, try to have your carbs last. Focus on your protein and veggies first, and then eat your carbs last. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about physical activity. Here are some really important rules to follow when you're starting physical activity to pre prevent any um, injuries. We wanna stay hydrated. Stretching is very important. And you wanna dress comfortably, make sure your shoes are not hurting or pinching you. Obviously safety is important, so if you're diabetic, checking your feet after exercises and even wearing an ID bracelet if you're gonna go out to the park where you can be identified as a diabetic if something were to happen. You wanna make it fun. So, you know, have some aerobic exercises, some resistance training, but also maybe include a friend. When it comes to exercise, um, in terms of how much to do, we do ask our patients to obtain about 150 minutes a week and that's moderate intensity. So what does that mean? Well, if you're out walking with a friend, you really shouldn't be able to have a conversation so easily. You should have, you know, that metabolic rate so high that you're not able to like completely complete a sentence. You don't wanna to miss too many days in a row. So you wanna have three more days of exercise and not miss more than two consecutive days. Resistance training is also important, gaining muscle mass. And if you have a desk job, it's important to get up every so often. So keep that in mind. Now we're gonna kind of finish up our discussion and I'd like you to think about other factors. So healthy eating and physical activity are important, but also you have to think about your sleep. If you're not sleeping well, that's gonna affect your sugars and your weight loss journey. So the quality and the quantity of your sleep. Stress levels are so important and your mood. It's important for you to connect with the mental health personnel if you are struggling and limited alcohol consumption, uh, which is two drinks for a male and one for a female. So in summary, focus on small changes and build from there. You wanna make it part of your lifestyle so you can be consistent. Find someone to partner with to make it fun and if you're doing everything possible and you're still not getting to goal, talk to your physician. There are other options like medications. Thank you everyone for joining me on this talk. Thanks so much, Dr. Jezel, for your informative presentation. Next, I'm very excited to introduce Chef Christina Perello of Christina Cooks. She's the author of seven health conscious cookbooks, one of which was named the healthiest cookbook of the decade by the Washington, Washington DC Physician Committee for Responsible Medicine. A noted author, she writes on a variety of healthy topics. Christina is on the faculty of the restaurant school at Walnut Hill College, where she lectures on culinary arts and nutrition. A cancer survivor, she also credits a radical change in her diet as playing a key role in her disease remission. A board member of the Farm T Market Trust, the Green Council of Philadelphia, the Green City Youth Council of Philadelphia, the Chefs for Humanity Chefs Council, and a member of the International Culinary Professionals and Women Chefs and Restaurateurs, Christine is also a recipient of the 2020 Philadelphia Award for Health Food. Using these various public platforms, as well as her expertise in the kitchen, Christina is a tireless advocate for healthy eating that doesn't sacrifice taste and flavor. Please join me in a big welcome to Chef Christina.
Hi, everybody. I'm Christina Perello from Christina Cooks on National Public Television, and this is my kitchen. Welcome to my kitchen. Um, I want to thank the lovely people at Deborah Hospital for inviting me to be part of this women's event and to provide a little bit of guidance towards making healthier choices as we go through life. Um, healthy cooking has the image of being um, complicated, boring, you have to do everything, you have to grow your own food, all of that's lovely. But I'm, I'm a lazy cook. I'm one of those people who wants to get dinner on the table quickly because I'm busy, just like everybody else. And as we go back out into the world, we're gonna get busy again. We might be home still having more time to cook, but those might change. Those things might change and you know, summer's coming. We want dishes that are light and fresh and happy and also keep us strong and vital and boost immune function so that we're metabolically fit to fight disease as we go forward back out into the world. So today we're gonna to make a dish that I call quinoa tabbouleh. When we all know tabbouleh, you know, bulgur with lots of herbs and cucumbers and tomatoes and olive oil, and it's delicious. Unless you don't like bulgur, which is how I came up with this recipe because I'm not a really big fan of the texture of bulgur, but I do love quinoa and not just because of its texture. I love quinoa for what it is. Quinoa is an ancient, uh, actually seed, we lump it in with cereal grains because that makes it easier for people to understand, but it's actually a seed, meaning that every quinoa plant sprouts from these little tiny seeds. Now these little tiny seeds come to us from the Andes and, and serve as an ancient grain. In fact, ancient people called it the mother seed and believed that it created the most powerful, sharp thinking warriors. What they didn't know was that quinoa is a complete protein, just like you get in an egg. So of course it made you stronger, so there you go. So quinoa is a teeny tiny seed, as I showed you. And so to ensure that your quinoa is delicious, when you buy it, your package will often say that it's pre-washed. Wash it again. There's an oil called saponin that coats every little seed of quinoa to protect it from the elements. If you don't wash it, your quinoa will have this bitter aftertaste and you'll think to yourself, I don't care how good this is for me, I'm not eating it. But if you rinse it, you'll get the lovely nutty taste that's native to quinoa, okay? So you're gonna cook quinoa. For this recipe, you can cook it two to one or I cooked it one and a half to one so that it's a little bit drier. And when you cook quinoa, you can see like a little sprout almost like a tadpole, like a little tail comes off each of the little grains. And that's how you know it's done. The beauty of quinoa besides its complete protein status is that it cooks in about 15 to 17 minutes. If you don't have time to cook quinoa, you need to rethink your life because you got to find 15 minutes to be able to cook a whole grain that's really good for you and makes you feel strong. So now that it's cooked, what we did was we cooked it so that it would be cool because when I make a salad like this tabbouleh, you don't want the quinoa to be hot because then your herbs and your tomatoes and your cucumbers and your roasted peppers will all kind of like wilt and so much for light and fresh, it becomes a total drag. So we're gonna start by setting the quinoa aside and quartering cherry tomatoes. Now your recipe calls for plum tomatoes you can use plum tomatoes or cherry tomatoes in this recipe. What you can't use, well, I mean, you can. What I don't advise you to use would be a regular vine ripened tomato, right? Usually, unless you've grown it in your own garden and you know the moisture levels, usually they just have too much liquid and they're gonna weigh down your salad again. So I tend to use cherry tomatoes or plum tomatoes, and it's not really, you know, tomatoes are just coming into season as you guys are watching this. So tomatoes, you want to make sure they're in season. Otherwise, they're hothouse tomatoes and they taste like pretty much nothing. And a test of your knife, by the way, little kitchen tip, test of your knife's sharpness is if you can cut tomatoes and not have them turn into tomato puree. So you really wanna make sure you use a sharp knife. Ironically, most people find this ironic. Ironically, the sharper your knife, the less likely you are to get cut. You wanna make sure you have a good knife and a good cutting board. And those are your best tools in the kitchen. So we're gonna set that tomato aside, bring the quinoa back and put our tomatoes on top. I'm not stirring anything just yet because 
I want to stir it all in together so nothing breaks up. When you're cooking, remember to clean your cutting area in between each veggie to create some order so you're not kind of, um, you know, feeling like everything's chaotic and also to keep your flavors separate, right? So the next thing we're gonna do is take some roasted peppers. Now you can buy red bell peppers, throw them on your grill and char them, put them in a paper sack, peel them, put them in a jar with olive oil and you have roasted peppers. In a pinch, you can buy roasted peppers. What I like about this particular roasted pepper in a jar is that it doesn't have vinegar. So you don't have that like sharp, acidic vinegary flavor in your roasted peppers. So I'm not going to lie to you in a pinch. I do have these and these are already chopped. So it does not get more convenient than these roasted peppers. I got to be honest. Now I'm making a smaller amount than your recipe calls for because it's just two of us for lunch. So that's that. The next thing to go in is cucumber. I'm using an English seedless cucumber. If you're going to use a straight up cucumber and they don't agree with you, then feel free to seed it. But an English cucumber doesn't usually have that kind of an issue. So what I did was cut it into spears and you're gonna see me do that again, and then cut it into chunks. And it goes right into your bowl. The other thing when you're cooking, especially if you're just assembling like this, you've got all your ingredients, don't put everything in little tiny dishes, chop them and throw them right in. Make your life as easy and streamlined in the kitchen as you possibly can. And you will fall in love with cooking if you're not in love with it now. I'm in love with it, so I don't have to work that hard to do that. So there we go. The next thing to go in are our fresh herbs. Now, the recipe calls for flat leaf parsley, which I love. But I'm also going to add some mint because my mint is really beautiful in the yard. You can add fresh basil. You can mix in thyme, fresh oregano. Since we're not making a traditional tabbouleh with, you know, uh, uh, bulgur, you, you can change this up how you want. You want to put fresh corn in here. You want to put uh, chickpeas. You want to add different kinds of herbs. Feel free, leave the garlic out. I don't care, whatever you want to do. This is a base. When I give you a recipe, when anybody gives you a recipe, the recipe is a guideline. This is how this can be. But then you vary it, you make it yours. Recipes don't really have what I call a soul. You know, they kind of have no spirit. They're just there. You have to infuse you into it. So while I gave you a recipe that called for parsley, and I'm gonna remove the thick stem of that parsley, I'm also gonna use some fresh mint. And we're just gonna coarsely chop it. I'm not gonna do any fancy chiffonade style cutting. You're gonna get it into a rough chop, and then you just Keep taking your knife and running it through it until you have the texture that you want. Tabbouleh is famous for having almost as much green herb as it does grain. So it's very heavy on the green part. So don't skimp when it comes to the fresh herbs. And also remember that, you know, quinoa gives us complete protein, tomatoes, give us vitamin C and lycopene. Red peppers give us fiber and vitamin C. Fresh herbs help to oxygenate the blood. Everything in the salad is designed to create some level of wellness, right? The cucumber helps to keep us cool and make our skin moist. You know, it's like everything in mother nature is not a random choice. Everything we choose will have an impact on the dish. So you just have to decide what it is that you want. So now, before we split and put the avocado in, we're going to dress it. Now your recipe calls for whisking the dressing together in a container and pouring it on the quinoa mixture. I never, ever do that ever, but it's the proper way to write a recipe, so I did. The way I do it is right into the bowl, mix it all in, and we're up. I, uh, I have a clove of garlic out. I am not gonna use the garlic. It just feels like it might taste too sharp. Raw garlic can really have a bite. So you have to decide if you want it or not. So it's up to you. I mean, garlic is an antifungal, antibacterial, delicious flavor. You can use it. I'm not gonna use it unless my husband shakes his head yes and says use the garlic. Nope, he's shaking his head no, no garlic. But I am gonna show you my favorite of all time kitchen hack. In my freezer, 
I keep lemons in a plastic bag. You know how you buy that big bag of lemons and before you know it, they've gone bad and you know, you lost your lemons. Someone on the Amalfi Coast taught me that you freeze them. When you buy your lemons, you freeze them. And when a recipe calls for lemon juice or lemon zest or both, you take a frozen lemon in a microplane and you start to grate. Yep, just like this. And you're gonna grate the lemon skin into the pith, right into the flesh. See how I'm going right into the white? Right through to the flesh of the lemon and you get the perfume of the zest, the flavor of the juice, and your lemons never go bad. And you have this amazing, amazing, amazing lemon flavor. I love this. I use this in everything from baking to a finish on a dish, a salad dressing, or something like this. And what I love about this is the lemon juice that you would normally add is not gonna weigh down my salad. And then your, your grated lemon, just like this, goes right back into the freezer in your plastic bag. And if you seal the bag well, you have lemons all the time. The next thing to go in is a tiny bit of brown rice syrup. You can use honey, but as a vegan, I tend to use rice syrup. It's gonna give a touch of sweetness to the final dish. This is just about a teaspoon or two. Brown rice syrup is a glucose-based fermented sweetener that um, digests slowly because it's partially complex carbohydrates. So it's actually really good for us as a sweetener. It, doesn't it does have calories. So you kind of don't have your cake and eat it, but a little bit. Okay. Next we'll go about two teaspoons of extra virgin olive oil. Use really good oil. And keep your oil not in the refrigerator, not in the refrigerator, but in either an opaque, dark glass, ceramic, or steel container, because that'll keep your oil from having the light hit it. Olive oil is a high heat oil. You can use it for anything. It's loaded with polyphenols and antioxidants for heart health, but it also is delicate in that if light hits it, you lose the flavor. Not the health benefits, but the flavor. And if you're going to spend money on really good olive oil, you kind of want the flavor. So preserve your olive oil well, and you'll be very happy that you did. So everything is in here. Now, when I cooked the quinoa, I cooked it with a pinch of salt. You can add another pinch of salt now because the acidity of the lemon will help to transform that salt into part of the dish so it doesn't taste salty. So I'm in love with a flaked salt from Sicily. So I'm gonna add just a touch. And if you look at this as, as the camera's on it, it almost looks like the salt is melting. So nobody's gonna bite down on a salt crystal that makes them think, ooh, a little too much salt in there, young lady. So now we're ready to add the avocado. Now the avocado can get added as a garnish on the top if it's really ripe or you can stir it in. I tend to put it sort of on the top in, in a pile rather than stir it in because it does break up. And if it's all broken up, it can turn my salad into mush. Plus this way, people who want the avocado can have it and those who don't, don't have to have it. And this is gorgeous. You know, when you, when you cook and when you're thinking about making dishes, especially if you're cooking for people who may or may not eat, the way that you eat or in a healthy manner or a plant-based diet or whatever we're calling it now. You know, how you might wanna be changing your food. You really wanna make sure that your food is beautiful. You don't want somebody to walk up to this bowl of quinoa and go, eh, I don't think so. It, it's gonna take somebody hardcore committed to junk food to not wanna taste something that looks as beautiful as this dish. Okay, so now we're gonna split our avocado. Now I will confess, I am not a genius at this, so let's see how it goes. So to split an avocado, make sure it's ripe, and you kind of run your knife all the way around it to split it in half. And then you turn it and it comes apart. To remove the seed, you plant your knife firmly into it, give it a turn, and you pop the, <laughs> you pop the seed off. You probably need a sponge or a towel to do that. Then we're gonna take a spoon and scoop the avocado right onto the cutting board. And if it's just perfectly ripe, which doesn't happen that often, 
it will not fall apart. Okay, so we've got our avocado. And now we're just gonna thinly slice it carefully, carefully, and lay those slices in the center of our dish. And if you don't use all the avocado, that's okay. Just add some lemon juice, a little olive oil to it, and kind of eat it on its own. If you love avocados, because you don't wanna overpower the dish with avocado. It's just really a garnish. And maybe one last drizzle of olive oil to make sure our avocado is nice and moist. And there you have it, guys. There's our quinoa tabbouleh, a whole grain, complete protein, ready to go, good fats, lots of veggies, healthy way to make a light, summery main course. And uh, I hope you have a great conference. And thank you again to Deborah. Bye, guys. Thanks so much, Chef Christina. That was really wonderful. Joining us now is Dr. Andrew Martin, DeBoris Chair of Pulmonary Medicine. Dr. Martin has been instrumental in launching a post-COVID recovery program at the hospital for what we call COVID long haulers. Those who have had the virus and recovered, thankfully, but are still experiencing symptoms weeks and even months after they were infected. As an expert in complicated pulmonary care issues, Dr. Martin is playing a pivotal role in diagnosing and coordinating the care for these patients. A sought after interviewer, Dr. Martin frequently contributes to consumer articles, not only on lung health and COVID, but for a wide range of pulmonary matters. Dr. Dr. Martin will be sharing some of his insights on post COVID recovery. Please join me in welcoming him today. Hello, I'm Dr. Andrew Martin. I am the Chair of Pulmonary Medicine here at Deborah Hart and Lung Center. And today I'd like to talk to you about COVID-19 infection, how it is spread, how it can be prevented, and what might be the aftermath of a COVID-19 infection should you get the virus. First of all, what is a coronavirus? Coronaviruses are a group of viruses that have been known for quite some time to cause about 20% of common colds overall. Coronaviruses have also been responsible for previous outbreaks of severe respiratory disease that you may have heard of before. There was the SARS epidemic or severe acute respiratory syndrome and the MERS epidemic or the Middle East respiratory syndrome. How they differed from the current COVID-19 pandemic was that they were not as easily transmissible and thus were more easily contained. The COVID-19 virus is actually referred to also as the SARS-CoV-2 virus because the syndrome itself is very similar. What makes COVID-19 so dangerous? Well, first of all, it has a high fatality rate. One to 3% may not sound very high, but if millions of patients become infected, as has happened, many patients will die, as has happened. And it is very easy to spread. This is partly because it can infect people without causing symptoms. And even when it does cause symptoms, it can take up to 14 days to make a patient sick. So during that time, a patient may be transmitting that virus to other people. It can be, so it can be spread by infected people without symptoms. We also know now that the spread is largely through the air. In terms of prevention, what do masks do? Well, the masks that most people wear generally prevent an infected person from spreading the virus to others. When you wear a normal mask, such as a surgical mask or a cloth mask, you are protecting others from yourself. When you wear an N95 respirator mask, you do protect yourself from incoming virus from other people. What masks don't do is increase carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide in the blood. And they don't keep people from breathing. What they do do sometimes is cause skin irritation. And in general, they tend to annoy people. 
What do vaccines do? Well, the currently available vaccines prevent between 75 and 95% of infections. And if a patient does become infected after being vaccinated, they all practically eliminate severe disease, hospitalization, and death from coronavirus. Serious side effects from these vaccines are extremely rare. You may have heard of very serious side effects in a few people out of millions. Most common side effects are low-grade fever, pain or discomfort at the injection site, or a simple headache, sometimes lasting one, but usually less than three or four days. Generally, the symptoms of COVID-19 are those that you might expect from any respiratory illness and will include shortness of breath or cough, often fevers and chills, sometimes diarrhea or other gastrointestinal symptoms. The loss of taste and or smell seems to be fairly specific for this virus. Other patients might experience heart-related symptoms such as palpitations or chest pain, what are the things that increase the risk for severe disease? Well, this list shows some of the things that we know increase the risk for severe disease. Cancer, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, COPD, pregnancy, current cigarette smoking, and obesity. Interestingly, asthma has not been shown to be a risk factor for severe disease. In fact, some studies suggest that asthma may actually be slightly protective against severe COVID-19 disease. Whether this is due to the particular immune environment in patients with asthma, or from some of the medicines they may take to control their asthma, such as inhaled steroids, is unknown at this time. What is the COVID long haul syndrome? We've been hearing a lot about that. Generally, we define this as patients who have symptoms that persist for three months or more after they've had their acute COVID-19 infection. Common symptoms of long haul COVID include generalized fatigue or weakness, shortness of breath, especially with exercise, chest pain or other forms of chest discomfort. Cognitive problems are a common complaint. They may include memory loss or trouble concentrating or doing calculations. And these are commonly referred to as brain fog. Many patients experience anxiety and or depression following a COVID-19 infection. Often patients will have persistent headaches and trouble sleeping, and sometimes persistent body and muscle aches also. However, most patients with COVID-19 infection will recover without permanent symptoms. So what might be causing my shortness of breath after I've had a COVID infection? Well, in many cases, it is simple deconditioning. This happens when a person gets ill and for the period of that illness doesn't exercise much, but afterwards, maybe because they're worried or because they just feel more short of breath, they don't get back to exercising as they did before. The problem with that is the longer it goes on, the harder it is to recondition. Some patients may actually develop ongoing lung problems after a COVID-19 infection. Some common lung problems after viral infections include asthma. And if you've had a severe pneumonia due to any cause, you may develop permanent lung scarring that impairs your lung function for a prolonged period or permanently. Some patients have developed heart problems after a COVID-19 infection. And these may include what's called cardiomyopathy, which again is basically the damage to the heart muscle itself. Or they may have rhythm problems such as atrial fibrillation, or other cardiac rhythm problems that cause them to be symptomatic. Other things that often cause shortness of breath are often overlooked and may or may not be related to COVID-19 infection might include simple anemia or thyroid problems. So what can I do if I feel short of breath after having a COVID-19 infection? At the Borough Heart and Lung Center in my post-COVID-19 clinic, I'm evaluating patients mainly who have shortness of breath with or without chest pain after having been infected. The first thing I do is review the course of the acute infection. Was the patient hospitalized or treated as an outpatient? What medicines were they given? If they were hospitalized, were they given oxygen? 
And if so, were they sent home with oxygen? Was there a stay in an intensive care unit or a need for a mechanical ventilator during the hospitalization? I will generally do a walk test for oxygen levels to make sure people aren't lowering their oxygen when they walk. And depending on what I find, I may do other testing. I may do a repeat chest x-ray or CAT scan to see if changes of the pneumonia on previous films have resolved or whether they have persisted or progressed. I may do formal lung function testing to look for consequences of lung injury or things such as asthma that can be treated. Physiologic exercise testing can help in actually measuring the patient's exercise capacity and precisely defining what is limiting their exercise. If there are cardiac issues, an electrocardiogram or an echocardiogram may be ordered. Tests for blood clots may be done depending on what we find. And other blood tests that look at thyroid function or look for anemia may also be done. We may also do sleep studies if patients have developed daytime sleepiness and other signs of sleep apnea, such as snoring. In summary, COVID-19 is still a very dangerous virus. And it's part of the reason it's so dangerous is that it can be spread by people who don't even know they have it. Masks are effective in preventing spread to other people and vaccines are effective in preventing infection. And when infection does occur in a vaccinated patient, they are effective in preventing severe disease hospitalization, and death. Prolonged symptoms are not uncommon, but it is unclear at this time whether most of these are specific to the COVID-19 virus itself, or are they simply related to the severity of the acute illness. Evaluation of prolonged shortness of breath may reveal treatable causes, such as post-viral asthma, heart rhythm problems, or anemia or thyroid problems. I thank you very much for listening this morning, and Please protect yourself and your loved ones and be safe. Thanks, Dr. Martin. I know we are hoping that the lingering effects of COVID-19 will resolve with proper medical management. And now I'd like to introduce our final speaker today, Michelle Martin of Teeming Health. Michelle is an integrative wellness coach, a Reiki master, and is focused on mind-body-spirit connection. She trained at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, New York City, in wellness principles and implementation through a variety of techniques, including guided med meditation and personal coaching. She helps with balancing emotions and stress. This helps women age gracefully so they can feel good at every step in their lives. I'm pleased to introduce Michelle Martin, who will share some of her mind, body, spirit inspirations. Good morning. I'm Michelle Martin, a holistic health practitioner who specializes in helping women, especially mature women like myself, navigate the changes we encounter as our body ages. I'm a firm believer that we're entitled to live a healthy and fulfilling life right to our last breath. As a health coach, I share practical tips to help you create your own individual roadmap for wellness. That being said, I know that many of you struggle with the demands on your body and mind because let's face it, you are the one that keeps everything going for everyone else. You keep the plates spinning and it's exhausting. And especially this year, as we have all dealt with the pandemic and what that meant for each of us. We take care of our children, our parents, our partners, and it has had some real challenges this year. Working from home, homeschooling, shopping and cooking differently, helping our elderly parents and friends schedule a vaccination. It's been an individual journey, but one with common threads. And the isolation, not having the usual social safety net that we're used to. Where are the hugs? Today, I'm going to introduce you to a simple meditation that I discovered this past year. 
I've been meditating daily myself for the last three years and the benefits are amazing. I feel more calm, more centered, and more connected to others than I ever have. And I believe this is a direct result of this daily practice. The one I'm going to share with you today is an ancient practice called Tonglen. Tonglen is an energy exchange practice. It is about bringing in and letting go. Bringing in what nourishes us and releasing what no longer serves us. How does that sound? I especially like that this is something you can do anywhere, any time of the day to center yourself with your breath. Are you ready to get started? You don't need any special equipment to do this. If you want to sit in a chair or on a cushion or lie on a mat on the floor, all of this is perfectly okay. When it comes to meditation, comfort is queen. If you're not comfortable, you won't do it. Let me give you a moment to get yourself settled. Okay, let's get started. Take a nice deep breath, and as you exhale, let your eyes close. Take another nice deep breath, feeling it all the way down in your belly. And now let it go. Breathe normally, in and out through your nose and your mouth, whichever's easier. And on your next breath, breathe in love. Breathe out fear. Breathe in strength and exhale weakness. Inhale joy and exhale sadness. Breathe in acceptance and breathe out judgment. Breathe in forgiveness and let go of blame. Inhale compassion and exhale finger pointing. Breathe in healing and let go of wounds. Breathe in gratitude and exhale grievances. Breathe in love and breathe out love to the universe. Breathe in love again, sweet loving kindness, and flow it out from you to the world. And breathe in and feel your conduit of love. And as you exhale, place a hand on your heart. You are a channel of divine love. Breathe in love again and feel your heart fill with love. Exhale and release all of that love to the universe, to every corner of the world. And feel that love return to you, filling up your heart. You may open your eyes. And throughout the rest of the day, allow this universal love to come from within and radiate out. Remember, we transform the world by transforming ourselves. I'm honored to share this practice with you and thank Deborah Hart and Lung Center for inviting me here today. I hope you found it useful. And I said, as I said earlier, I'm a practical coach and I share tools that are easy to implement yet start to make a difference right away. If you want to learn more, please let register for my self-care masterclass. It's a one hour online session this Wednesday, June 30th at 8 p.m. on Zoom. The best part of this is you and a friend can do it together. 
I hope to see you there. And again, thank you for your time today. Thanks, Michelle. This brings us to the end of our virtual Women to Women Talk Heart to Heart event today. I hope this has been an, as enlightening for you as it has been for me. It is wonderful that you took the time out of your busy weekend to focus on your own health and well-being. It was a pleasure hosting today, and I'm wishing you the very best of health and well-being Thanks again for joining us this morning, and thank you to Deborah Heart and Lung Center.